Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Busco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so today I'm going to review a wine from a winery I'm very familiar with, Domaine Bousquet. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll recognize this winery. The 32nd history is that Jean Bousquet went to Argentina on vacation in 1990. He visited the Guatiati Valley and decided it would be an ideal place to grow grapes. It was an arid, high altitude location. He bought a bunch of land in 1997 and the water rights to drill a very deep well as irrigation would be absolutely required. As a result, they are able to farm organically. If you want the longer version, be sure to check the link in the description to get the full story from one of my earlier reviews. One thing about this wine that's a bit different than the others I've reviewed is that it's a kosher for Passover wine. You may be saying, wasn't Passover a few months ago? Yeah, I've had the wine for like a minute. That Texas wine documentary I was working on earlier this year really delayed my reviews. Anyway, the bottom line is that it is a kosher wine, so it's not something that needs to only be used for Passover. According to the information I got, this is the first USDA organic kosher wine from Argentina. It's also not super common. Let's step that back for a second. What makes a wine kosher isn't the source material, but the handling and winemaking process. This means Sabbath observant Jews do everything from crush to bottling. This also means that any additives like non-native yeast, finding materials, and other additives must be considered kosher. So, since the head winemaker is not a Sabbath observant Jew, he could not even taste the wines during the process. He can't even touch the tanks. There has to be an entire team dedicated to making this one wine, and this is the only kosher wine they make. Plus, it's the inaugural vintage as far as I know. This is a big investment for them. I'm going to guess that they will, have make, they will make other kosher wines too. So how the grapes are farmed is not a requirement, nor does that mean kosher additives are organic. However, in this case, 100% of the grapes are certified organic as indicated by the USDA organic logo. It also means that no more than 5% of anything used in the making of the wine is not organic. That could be literally anything, but the thing is 100% has to be kosher. So if these two things are important to you, then this wine is a great candidate. One more thing, the word a la vida is a one word version of the phrase a la vida. Spanish for to life. It's similar to the Hebrew toast behind. Let's get into the stats of the wine. It's the 2021 Domain Bousquet Alavida Malbec. The suggested retail price is $19. It is a USDA certified organic wine. It is also kosher for Passover. 100% Malbec it is vegan friendly, gluten free. I'll address this in a minute. The total city is 5.77 grams per liter, the pH is 3.68, the ABV is 14.5%, and the residual sugar is 1.52 grams per liter. All right, while I'm pouring this, as my script says, and I usually try to control my script while I'm reading it, uh, let's talk about the gluten-free thing for a minute. Um, it's kind of a soapbox thing for me, um, this gluten-free thing I've been seeing recently. And before I get too far up, off script, let's just put this down. I'm really excited to try this wine, though. I, all of Bousquet's wines, I feel, are, are really great. Anyway, so um, so this is, like I said, this is like kind of a soapbox thing. And this is not, this is in no way meant to be overly critical of my friends at Creative Palette who've supplied the wine for free to me, or Domain Bousquet. While there is a small chance, and I do many a small chance of a wine containing gluten, all wine is gluten-free. There are two ways gluten can get into wine. Actually, it's more than two, but the two ways as far as wine production, finding materials and a wheat flour paste to seal the heads of the barrels. Now, this wheat paste is put into the groove in the staves, 
for the heads to sit into. And there's no gluten that's going to touch the wine, at least as far as I've been able to find out from researching this ad nauseum. Okay. First, there are no gluten products approved by the TTB to be used in the production of wine. While there have been stories of some form of gluten being used to fine the wine, it's not been used in a very long time. Maybe there's a 50-year-old wine that has it. I don't know. It's never, I mean, never mentioned as a fining agent anywhere I've studied wine. Now, I will say that the EU, kind of weird, it does say they have, they do approve it, a gl gluten product to be used as a fining agent. I will also say I found several studies that they talked about using it. They, they studied using it, but there was no, the, even the studies say they don't know of any wine in current production that actually uses gluten in any form or fashion. Okay, second, barrels. I've never heard of this being a technique that's currently used as far as using the wheat paste to seal the barrels. Now, despite the articles I've linked in the description saying that it's done, I'll have to further investigate this type of thing. I mean, I've been investigating quite a bit and I still can't find anything, but I'll keep looking at it. The reason I say this is that you'll find that the links also mention studies where if there was gluten in wine, it was under 10 parts per million. And it was it came from the barrels. And this, these were tests. These weren't like real world things. And really the only way gluten could have gotten into the wine would be as far as some stray wheat flour getting into the wine from, I don't know, the application or hitting inside a barrel or just like some stray wheat in the air. Maybe it was, they were baking bread or whatever. And it, you got like that cross-contamination type of thing. You know, like you see the warnings, you know, made for, you know, products that were made in you know, like plants with nut and gluten. Anyway, if a product is under 20 parts per million, it is considered gluten-free and typically safe for someone with celiac disease, which is less than 0.75% of the population. I'm not trying to make light of this, but first of all, wine is pretty much gluten-free. It, it is gluten-free and a very small portion of the population is affected. Okay, and I'll get this in a second. The TTB doesn't allow a product to claim gluten-free if gluten was used in the processing. So in this respect, I'm sure that this wine is 100% accurate that it's gluten-free. The bottom line is that all wine is gluten-free by default. I've never heard of anyone in almost 30 years I've been in the food and beverage industry having an issue with wine in that sense, especially the past 17 years that I've been studying wine. It literally never comes up in any professional setting, and I've been to a lot of professional events, conferences, trade shows, seminars. Not to sound like a jerk, but it's like putting gluten-free on a bottled water. So, like, again, I've never had to worry as a restaurant tour that if I serve somebody a glass of wine or a bottle of wine, that I would even have to think about them having celiac and having reaction. If you have celiac, you are the actual people that you have to be careful with gluten. Like, it hits you pretty quickly, okay? Um, and it's, it's not fun. Okay, so I'm not making light of the situation. It's just kind of like, I don't know. Now, I love Domaine Bousquet and I think they are doing everything right. But I do think this is getting into the kind of labeling and marketing that I kind of find unnecessary. Now, I reached out to my contact Creative Palette to ask the winery for more information. They just said that they have the wine tested to ensure it is free of gluten. So, I mean, that's good. You know, but sorry, I'm not a fan of this kind of thing. And it will eventually be part of a series of Freestyle Friday videos on the topics of health claims, labeling, additives, et cetera. So look for that. So you'll see enough, you'll see some more research into the whole gluten thing, among other things. Again, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like be critical of Domaine Bousquet or, or trying to like say they're going over the top with it. It's fine. You want to label gluten-free. It's, it, it's, it was tested. It's hundred percent certified gluten-free. You never know. There might be some winery that has people making breads or using gluten somewhere nearby and they're just they're just being extra 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 careful maybe somebody on the staff is celiac and maybe they had some problems with a wine at some point who knows anyway well, enough whining about things let's get into the wine because that's the important part right not the other stuff i mean it's important but i don't want to make such a big deal of it all right so um we've got kind of like a kind of a brighter like ruby red, a um, little bit of fuchsia. We got like moderate staining on the glass. You know, something you know totally expect with with Malbec. There's a little bit of pink to it. So that electric pink or that pink quality um, is super like 
indicative of Malbec. It's not like the only, like you see that you're not gonna like, oh, it's, it's Malbec. But I mean, it's that fuchsia, like it would be like on the top of my list as to what I think this wine would be if I was doing a blind tasting. Oh, that's like moderate. That is like moderate uh, uh, tearing. What was the alcohol again? I thought it was like 14%. We're going we're gonna to check that out again. Sorry, I had to go back to my script to find the thing. But yeah, I don't remember it being very high. 14.5. Wow. That's cool. Well, I'm really interested to, uh, to get into the wine. Ooh, wow. Okay. Anyway, it's moderate plus intensity. It's definitely youthful. I mean, it's a 2021, right? Got lots of red fruit in there. It kind of smells like the wine. It actually kind of smells like barrels. Kind of like, um, kind of like, you know, wine barrels. I don't get a ton of fruit on the nose. I can't smell the alcohol though. I mean, it's really kind of, kind of burning the nostrils a little bit. It's like a raspberry, you know, Cure Royale type of thing. Yeah, I get a little bit of, I get a little bit of, uh, um, um, wood, like actual, like wood, not oak, not like oak barrel, but like wood, a little bit of a uh, polished wood, a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit of wood polish. I guess it's a clean, like, like, uh, purple flowers, like freshly hosed down, like the winery just got, just hosed down. You got like a little bit of, a uh, a little bit of, um, 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 not potpourri, a little bit of, um, incense, a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like walking into the old school pier one, or I guess now world market type of thing. You got that kind of, uh, uh, combination of, of spices and wood type of thing going on. Yeah. Or like scented candles, you know, like you walk into like a shop that's got that type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, let's taste it. That's a big boy. I mean, alcohol is pretty up there. It's juicy. Like, the fruit is like, not quite candied, but it's ripe. And it's got that, it's got like, it's, it's, it's in, I use this for my, um, some of my Chilean cab references like a Luxardo version of things. So it's like, like a Luxardo thing, but you threw like a shot of vodka or two in there. So it's like, it's like having fruit in it's in like a syrup, but with, with like some alcohol. And then you've got like the, and then you're in your, so it's like you're, you're, you're sipping on, you're, you're drinking the, the you're drinking the syrup from a Luxardo version or similar, like raspberry, like a Kirsch type of thing. Um, uh, raspberry or even like hibiscus, like the can, like the stuff in the, in the syrup. And you're like sipping on that. And maybe you threw a little bit of vodka in there, like a little bit of alcohol. And you're sitting in like a spice candle shop. That's kind of cool. And they're about to serve you some charcuterie, some really dense meats, like some chorizo, uh, salamis, which is chorizo, right? Just different country. But like some 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 meats, some cheeses, all the meats and cheeses. Yeah, and we're talking like rich cheeses, like like soft cheeses, things that are creamy, not necessarily hard cheeses. Um, the tannin is really building up right now. Um, the alcohol, while I do feel it, it on the palate, it feels more integrated than it was on the nose. But it, it's there. It's super tasty. I'm digging that spice shop. That 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 polished wood um, type of thing on the retronasal thing when when when, when I'm sw swirling it and I'm breathing out through my nose I'm really digging that type of of uh, thing to it. It is good. It is over the top. I think I think it's I think it's you know it, it's it's not a shy wine. I think there's some people out here that might be like, no, it's not their style. Any wine could be not someone's style. Um, I think on certain days, I might be like, nah, man, this is like way too much. And I think today is the right day for me to try it. What is it a fruit day or something like that? I don't know. Anyway, um, guarantee you it's a root day. I'm not going to look it up right now, but if I remember, I'm going to look up today's date, which is uh, the 25th of July and it's six o'clock 
in the afternoon, 1802 precisely. I'm going to see what day it is to see uh, how it how it's affecting my tasting of this wine. Yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit much, and it's like really kind of like there's a lot of spice characteristics going on there. So what would I pair it with? I can do pizza with it, like pepperoni pizza, meat lovers pizza, just cheese pizza. Um, I could do something like that. I could do barbecue. I think barbecue would be a good choice. Um, I think this is somewhat like a Zinfandel acting type of thing, but not quite. I enjoy it better. Well, I don't know. Zinfandel, I like Zinfandel a lot, and I like Malbec. Some Malbecs I'm not a fan of. Like, I had some Malbec the other day, and I was like, yeah, it was all right. Um, but that's what I really like. But I can see having, like, barbecue with it. I see having hot dogs, hamburgers, that type of thing. Especially if you have like, um, I'm not saying that you need the relish, but like say you put some relish on that hot dog or you have like a bratwurst or like sausages type of thing. And maybe the mustard, brown mustard might be a little much for that. But if you have like ketchup going on there, I think the ketchup would work well with, with this, like a hamburger. Like my lunch today was, was a and that TMI, but it was a little bit weird. I had an ultimate cheeseburger from, from Jack in the Box. This would have gone great with that because you've got like a couple different cheeses. You have a, 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 um, it works somehow it works mayo and ketchup and I think mustard too. A uh, combination. You got this kind of a sweet, tangy thing. Um, somehow it works. Uh, and I haven't had one of those in forever. And this would be a great one with that literally the ultimate cheeseburger from Jack in the Box. Yeah, I think it'd be great with that. Anyway and do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time.